Hello, this is uh, Vince Morrow. I'm an associate professor at the Scripps Research Institute. And I'm going to be talking about codon optimization today. And um, th there'll be a, a question and answer sh session at the end, but feel free to, uh, to post your questions anytime during the presentation. At the end, there will be a link so that you can earn edu educational credits. So the, the technology I'm going to be talking about today is, is codon optimization. And, and this is a gene engineering approach that's used pretty extensively to increase protein production predominantly. It's used for recombinant protein drugs, gene therapy, uh, DNA and RNA vaccines. And it, it's, it's very broadly used, but recently it, it's become uh, clear that Codon optimization is, is not neutral and can have a number of effects on the protein that's being expressed, including affecting the conformation of the protein, its function. It, in some cases, you, you increase the immunogenicity or reduce the efficacy. So even though you're making more protein, you may be having these negative effects. These, these uh, problems have been discussed before, and I'll just briefly review them, but the, the point of this talk is on uh, some new hazards, some potentially new hazards of codon optimization, particularly for in vivo applications, which would be things like uh, gene therapy and uh, genetic vaccines. So the the topic codon optimization. So codon optimization has been, you know, widely used with protein drugs, biotech drugs, and I mean it turns out that proteins have some proteins have important therapeutic value and since these, you know a lot of these proteins are found in your body they have a lot of advantages in terms of uh, safety and dosing and so on and th these proteins can be administered two ways either as drugs or they can be expressed in vivo so in the person and when you're when you're making a protein as a drug you you can express it in e coli there's a lot of different production systems, yeast, insect, mammalian cells, there's transgenic plants and animals. The, uh, most, uh, most of these proteins are expressed in Chinese hamster ovary cells. This is a uh, cell line of choice because um, it has very good uh, growth properties, very good expression properties. But you, you can also express uh, therapeutic proteins or antigens in vivo, gene therapy, mRNA therapy, DNA and RNA vaccine. So in, in these cases, the constructs are inside the patient and the protein synthesis is occurring inside the person. So in, in either case, if you're, if you're making a therapeutic protein as an industrial scale process, or if you're expressing it in a, in a, in a, pro, in a person, uh, you have to have protein synthesis. And so this is a biological process that occurs in the cells. And so if you're, if you're expressing in a, in a cell line or, uh, for example, a DNA vaccine or uh, gene therapy, uh, you introduce a construct with a gene of interest. And here in the DNA, the gene of interest would, would be the, the blue segment, which is transcribed into a messenger RNA, which is translated into a protein. If you're, if you're working at, with RNA therapeutics or RNA vaccines, then you, you just cite you get around the DNA step, you make the, the RNA in vitro, and you start with the RNA, and the RNA is translated into protein. Now, the, the, the translation process itself consists of three steps, fundamentally, initiation, elongation, and termination. And so the initiation step is, is where you, you get a translation, a ribosomal complex, so you have the 40S and 60S ribosomal subunits, forming at the start site of protein synthesis, and this is typically an AUG triplet, an AUG codon. Elongation is the process whereby the, the ribosome decodes the message and makes a peptide. And termination, they're, they're stop codons, so at the end of a coding sequence, the protein synthesis will stop, the, the complex will dissociate, and the, the subunits can um, be reused, and, and the peptide is released. Um, so, in, in order to understand codon optimization at, at a deeper level, I think it's important to review initiation and elongation. So, so 
the process can be better understood. So the initiation step involves the small 40S ribosomal subunit, which is the, this little green blob attached to the purple squiggle. The purple squiggle is a tRNA. It's the initiator methionine tRNA. And it's associated with the small ribosomal subunit. And this is important, finding the spot in the message where translation initiates. And this is typically an AUG triplet, an AUG codon, and the tRNA base pairs to the AUG codon. When, when this happens, and so the initiator tRNA is, is covalently linked to its amino acid, with, which is methionine. And when, when this happens, then the large ribosomal subunit comes in and, and you, it forms what's called an ADS ribosomal complex. When this happens, the, the tRNA is, is positioned in the P site of the large subunit. And so now the, ne the next step is, is when elongation begins. And so uh, the next codon in, in this message, it be translation goes in a five prime to three prime direction, is GGG. And so the next T a tRNA that can recognize that codon will come into the A site and it base pairs to the GGG. Then what happens is the ribosome has a peptidyl transferase activity, so the methionine amino acid on that first tRNA becomes linked to the glycine on the second. And, and so now you have the, the original tRNA, which is vacant of, a, of an amino acid, and you have uh, a dipeptide, met gly, on the second tRNA. Now the ribosomal subunit shifts so it moves three nucleotides, one codon in the five prime to three prime direction. And so now the, the empty, uh, the vacant tRNA is in the E site, and the dipeptide containing tRNA is in the P site. The, the empty, the vacant tRNA is ejected, and the, the process is then repeated, right? So the next codon, GUG, well, you get a shift. The next GUG, this, this is valine. So this encodes valine. And so the valine tRNA comes in. Then you get a peptidyl transferase, rea transferase reaction. So now you have met glyvale hooked to the valine tRNA. The ribosome shifts. The, the vacant tRNA is ejected, and so on. And this, and this process continues until you, you reach a stop codon, at which, at which point the, the uh, the peptide is released and, and the subunits dissociate and start over. Um, and so that, that cartoon illustrates elongation. Um, but I think it's important to, to remember that different amino acids can be encoded by more than one codon, right? So there are 20 amino acids, and only, only methionine and tryptophan are encoded by single codons. All of the others are encoded by two, three, four, or six. So 61 codons encode 20 amino acids. The, the remaining three are stop codons. But when you think about codon usage and, and translation, uh, uh, an important consideration is wobble, um, although it's often ignored, I think. And it's interesting because many, many cells have less than 61 tRNAs, and 61 would be what you would need if every codon had a tRNA corresponding to it, right? But, but this isn't the case. But nevertheless, messages still contain all of the codons, and they can still be translated, and they can be decoded because of Wobble. So Wobble was, was originally proposed by, by Crick in the, uh, in the 1960s, and suggested that when, when you're decoding, the first two nucleotides in the codon base pair by standard watching Crick base pairing, but the, the base pairing rules are relaxed for the third position, right? So, so y you can, uh, for example, have GU base pairing. And because of wobble, there are some tRNAs that can bind to several codons for the same amino acid. And so if we look at codon, anticodon, base pairing, so what we, what we see is that uh, the codon, and, and so the message is, is indicated in a five prime to three prime direction, and the codon is three nucleotides, one, two, three, 
And codon 3 is, is the wobble position. And this base pairs to a tRNA, which is indicated by this box structure. But so each box is just a nucleotide. And there's a, a, a three nucleotides in the, in the tRNA, which is called the anticodon, which is nucleotides 34, 35, and 36. So nucleotide 34 base pairs to, to the third position. So this is the wobble, this is the wobble interaction. Now, it's, it's a little more complicated because uh, for, for seven of the tRNAs in, in yeast and eight in, uh, in eukaryotes, the adenosines in position 34 get deaminated to inosine. And, and this is important because it, it, uh, it changes the, the, the base pairing potential of that, of that nucleotide. So if we look at an anticodon-codon interaction, uh, if you had a U in position 34, it can base pair to A at the third codon position, or it could wobble base pair to G. A G could base pair to a C or wobble base pair to U, and an indicine could, could pair to U, C, or A, right? So th this, this uh, expands the, the, the possibility of, of what tRNAs can, can decode. And there's a... There's another, what might be a special case or not, which, which has been described in chloroplast, which is called super wobble. And in the chloroplast, it, it turns out that 25 tRNAs are sufficient for, for survival, so that, that's all you need. And the, the reason this can occur is because of super wobble, which is an unmodified U in position 34, which, base pairs, which can base pair to C, G, A, or U. Uh, whether it occurs in, in other cellular systems is not known yet, but uh, it, it's a possibility. Now, this uh, codon table can be rep represented in different ways. And here I've represent, re represented it in, in a circular configuration. And, and here I'm trying to show wobble, codon usage, and presence or absence of tRNA genes in human. And, and so the, the outside ring is the amino acid, and this is a, a single letter code for the, for the amino acids. The, the, the codon itself is, is the inner, middle, and outer nucleotide rings are the first, second, and third positions of the, of the codon. And, and the, the green bars indicate the codons that are capable of wobble pairing to a tRNA via an inosine interaction. The, the blue bars show where you can get wobble, GU or UG wobble. The, the gray bars, this is uh, trying to indicate codon frequency. So this is, this is the, um, you know, zero to 100, white to black, um, the, the frequency at which the different codons are, are, are used, that they show up. And I have more to say on codon frequency, but so the, the level of gray indicates how often those codons are used. And the red indicates uh, tRNAs that, that lack a tRNA gene. So you can see in, in human, there are 13 tRNAs that don't have a corresponding gene, right? Uh, this, is, this is kind of interesting. Now, if you, if you look at... Uh, codon usage and presence or absence of a tRNA gene. But, I mean, if we just look at proline, so you can see that the codon CCC does not have a, a tRNA corresponding to that codon, but it's, it's used with a, a certain frequency indicated by the gray. If you look at CCU, it's used with about the same frequency, although this one does have a, a gene that corresponds to it. So, in those two examples, they're used about the same, even though one has a gene and the other one doesn't. And if you look at CCG, the gene, it has a gene present, but that one's used much less, right? So you, you can, uh, uh, it, it, it appears as if the presence or absence of a tRNA gene doesn't, doesn't appear to affect the, the distribution of or the codon usage. And so just to kind of drive the, the, the point home a little bit more, uh, so synonymous codon changes don't alter the amino acid composition of a protein, just, just 
the mRNA sequence. So in this example, MET3 His peptide is, is encoded. It's the same peptide, but it's encoded by, by mRNAs that differ at different nucleotide positions. So different, different messages can give rise to the same protein. So um, discuss a little bit about codon optimization. So this is, this is an approach uh, whereby synonymous codons are used to, to change the message and the, the main purpose is, well, there are probably two main purposes. One of the main purposes is to, to increase protein expression, um, facilitating gene, th gene synthesis is, 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 the, is the second. Um, and so I'd like to just discuss this a little bit. Uh, so, you know, how did, how did, how did people even uh, come to do the codon optimization? And, and some of it is historical, right? So initially, the first recombinant peptide that was expressed, somatostatin, it, it was made in E. coli, and they made this without even knowing the mRNA sequence, right? So they reverse translated the amino acid sequence to obtain a coding sequence. And, and since they didn't know what the natural codon usage was, they, they could use whatever codons they wanted, and, and they biased it in a certain way to suit, to, to suit their needs. And so they, they used codons that were preferentially used by the MS2 bacteriophage. They, they used codons that would avoid having GC-rich regions followed by A-rich, AT-rich regions that might terminate transcription. And they, they used codons that allowed them uh, to generate oligonucleotides that would make the gene synthesis easier. And at about the same time as gene sequences were, were being revealed and published, it, it, was, it was noticed right from, right from the get-go that uh, the genes were using codons in a non-random manner. Some codons were preferred over others. And, and you can see the, this, this bias in codon usage in codon uh, usage tables. And, and here, here we have one for human and one for E. coli. And what, what you can see, for example, UUU, 17.6 in human. So that means that it's, uh, the UUU codon is used with a frequency of 17.6 per thousand codons, right? And in, in E. coli, it's 24.4. And so the, these kind of bias codon usage tables are, exist for pretty much all organisms. And if you if you look at individual uh, amino acids, codons encoding individual amino acids, you, you can see that it's uh, it's not evenly distributed, right? So, for example, for leucine in human, CUG is used with a frequency of 39.6 and CUA with, at 7.2. So that, those are kind of the extremes. In, in E. coli, the extre it goes from 37.4 to 5.6. Now, interestingly, in, in both cases, CUG is the most abundant codon for, for leucine and CUA is the least abundant. The, the others uh, don't, don't follow the same ranking. But so this, this gives you an idea of uh, bias in codon usage in, in different organisms. Now there, there are a series of I think of fairly important observations that have have led to codon optimization approaches. And one is that it, it was observed that highly expressed genes in fast-growing organisms, like E. coli, uh, preferentially use a subset of codons, right? So they're, they're not used randomly. And some studies had shown that the bias was correlated with tRNA abundance. Um, another important observation is that because the, the code is, the genetic code is degenerate, um, almost all proteins can, can be encoded by an almost infinite number of mRNA sequences. The third important observation is that if you start looking at the translation from those different sequences, they vary dramatically, right? So, so different synonymous mRNAs, even though they encode the same protein, will express that protein at very different levels. So if, if uh, highly expressed genes use a subset of codons, are our codon bias and protein expression causally linked? 
And if, if they are, then it's, it would be possible to enhance expression just by mimicking the, the bias that you see in the highly expressed mRNA. And, and this prospect has led to the broad use of codon optimization and codon modified constructs for bioproduction, gene therapy, genetic vaccines. And there are, there are many codon optimization programs and commercial services for doing this. And the different approaches you know, vary in how they measure codon bias, the different variables that they consider, their applications, how they implement them. And, but a general feature of, of most, if not all, of the approaches is to avoid using rare codons, which are thought to decrease the rate of translation elongation and limit protein synthesis. And so different approaches quantify codon usage in, in different ways, and different programs have different features. In, in some cases, to make cloning easier, and for example, you, you can add or remove restriction sites, so the fragments that you synthesize uh, can, go to, can go together easily or so that you can clone into a, a specific vector. Um, and, and, so, and so the, the oligonucleotide synthesis and design it becomes an important feature. Um, and in, in, so, in some cases, for some of the programs, that is the primary uh, goal uh, of the programs. And in a lot of cases, all, all you need to supply is an amino acid sequence. So the, the, the authentic codon usage of the gene is, is, is not a constraint at all. And, and so, uh, you know, you, you know if, you, if you start just changing codons, you know, willy-nilly, um, you, you can run into other problems. And, and so, a lot of the programs consider some, some of the some uh, other variables. For example, sequences that might destabilize the message, or that might affect the context of the initiation codon. Secondary structures. In, in the message that, that might form with, in, with certain synonymous mRNAs but not others, repeated sequences, the nucleotide composition, the, the presence, the, so the, the introduction of uh, splice sites that might splice out a part of the mRNA, putative um, entry sites that, that might direct translation to a, a different position in the message, promoter sequences that might generate shorter RNAs, for example. And in some of the programs also consider uh, information about the, the protein structure itself, right? Um, stop codons, dinucleotides that can affect cleavage, and, and so so. Th there are a lot of variables that that are, are looked at because w one, once you once you start changing codons, you've you've disrupted the, the natural sequences, but you, you in many cases you've reintroduced sequences that will cause a problem and that have to be taken into account. And so, because there are so many different codons, um, if you make a message via one program or another program, they're, they're, they're going to be different because they, they, approach, they approach the process in, in different ways. And for example, uh, some, some approaches use the most optimal they, they, or frequently used codon every time a particular amino acid comes up or a variation of that, that approach, you know, top two, for example. Um, other approaches adjust codon usage so that it's more proportional to the natural distribution. There's approaches called codon harmonization. So you try to maintain regions where you have rare codons, so uh, you, you, you try not to disrupt protein folding, for example. Other approaches use information about um, using co codons that might correspond to abundant tRNAs or just selectively replacing the rare codons but keeping other, other things um, more or less the same or uh, avoiding codon pairs, like to, in some, which in some cases are known to slow down translation. And with codon optimization, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it really is not one solution that solves all problems. I mean, there, there are specific applica applications of, of this technology. So in some cases, it, it's used to, when you're expressing an mRNA from one organism in a different organism, it's to try to 
um, use the, the codon bias of the host, right, which is, which is thought, to, which is thought to, to give you a protein that might more closely mimic what was in the, in the original organism. Um, in some cases, it's used to design um, RNAi-resistant genes for gene rescue experiments. Um, the different approaches have been used for DNA vaccines and, and gene therapy. It's interesting because plasmids with unmethylated CPG motifs can activate vertebrate immune systems. And so the plasmids that are made for these applications are, are unmethylated, but different CPG motifs can either stimulate or neutralize the immune response. And so they've become an important consideration for DNA vaccine and gene therapy plasmids. So, so for example, for DNA vaccines, it is useful to stimulate the immune system. And so codon uh, optimization programs designed for that application will maximize the number of immunostimulatory motifs and decrease the immunoneutralizing motif. And for gene therapy, you don't want to activate the immune system. And so it, you, 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 you do that the other way around. Um, and, and so, so that, that's, that's basically a little bit about codon optimization. Uh, but the, the, the whole process is based on a number of assumptions, which I'd like to get into in a little bit more detail here. And so three, uh, there, there are probably more, but we'll, we'll take a look at three of the underlying assumptions of codon optimization. Um, one, rare codons are rate limiting for protein synthesis. Two, Synonymous codons are interchangeable, and three, replacing rare codons increases protein production. So one, rare codons limit protein synthesis. There's actually very little evidence that this is true. Um, there's, there's evidence in, for example, in E. coli with highly expressed genes, uh, but e except for those sorts of examples, the correlations between codon usage and expression are very weak. And in a, in a lot of cases, the, the, the codon bias can be accounted to a large extent just by the GC content of, of genomes. Um, so, and some studies have shown that translation rates of different specific codons don't correlate with tRNA abundance or frequency of codon use. And if you, if you think about it, it, it seems it would seem almost unlikely that a rare codon would be limiting for translation since most of the most of the codons can be decoded by more than one tRNA by wobble base pairing. And, and so just taking a look at this in a little more detail, is so in this in this histogram where I've I plotted the, the codon frequency, same thing that was in that table. So codon frequency per a thousand codons versus different codons. And and you can see it. So if you look this is human data. If you look at the rarest 10 codons, they, they, they all have a cognate tRNA, so they all have a, a gene that can uh, decode them, but the rarest eight also have, can also be decoded by wobble, right? And if, if we look at the, the difference in, in codon frequency, it's about tenfold from the highest to the lowest. But if you look at it a little bit more closely, what, what you find is that the, the, the amino acid that are encoded the most often tend, tend to have more codons, right? And so if you take that into consideration and you normalize it, number, number of codons per amino acid, then these differences go from about tenfold to about threefold. And so no, another issue that I've been wondering about is, is whether rare codons are, are even categorized correctly. and um, and I, I try to explain my concerns here. So there, there are a number, if you think about it, there are a number of limitations of the codon usage tables, right? So, they're co so these codons, and, and I, I had it in my circular representation, they're rare or abundant just based on the, and the codon table, just based on their occurrence in coding sequences. And this is without considering mRNA t levels, right? So. Um, uh, codon usage in an abundant message is is considered the same as in a rare message, right? It, it's, it's it's one to one. Um, codon usage 
is, is considered only for the, the ORF of interest, but we know that there is a lot of alternative initiation that occurs at both in-frame, alternative in-frame initiation codons, and out-of-frame initiation codons. And these are, these are not even considered, it would be very difficult to consider them at this point, but these are not even considered when codon usage is, is, is evaluated, even though they would <coughs> probably dramatically skew codon usage. So codon usage in human is just kind of an overall score. Tissue-specific differences aren't, aren't uh, taken into consideration which messages and the codon uh, usage in those messages, and you know, if you're rare or if you're if you're limiting or if you're not, I think it has more to do with the levels of the of the tRNAs, the cognate and the wobble tRNAs, than than the codon frequency. And, and I think you can just as easily imagine that a rare codon is the one that that would be limiting if the tRNA is limiting, right? So it's it's and again, this this is this is rarely considered. Um, so there is very little evidence that rare codons limit protein synthesis, um, and, and you know and this is this is supported by you know a different line of, of studies which which indicate that translation initiation is is the step that is rate limiting for protein synthesis, not elongation. And, and this is a and this is a notion that uh, I think the translation field accepts generally as a, as a fact. The second assumption that uh, synonymous codons are are interchangeable. Um, so the synonymous codons were, were, I mean, they were, they were thought of as silent um, mutations or silent changes, be, because the, the amino acid sequence wasn't changed, and and it, and it was believed that the amino acid sequence was um, all that was necessary to to give you uh, the same protein. Um, Synonymous mutations were, were thought to be neutral during evolution, and you know, this is this was elaborated in the neutral theory of, of molecular evolution um, a few years back. But more recently, study, studies have shown that synonymous mutations are associated with human disease, and there's, there's a growing list of diseases that, that it's greater than 50 at this point that are associated with synonymous mutations. And it's becoming clear that different mRNAs, even though they are including the same protein, don't give you the equivalent protein. And the, the, the effects can be at, at multiple different levels. Um, different changes can affect the splicing stability, uh, how efficiently you initiate translation, elongation, altered kinetics, and this is an important point, protein folding. Um, and, and, and finally, it, when, you, uh, when you change the codons, you're, you're maintaining the amino acid coding information, but you're disrupting any other information that's encoded in the primary sequence. And this includes any, any sequence elements that might base pair to other RNAs, such as microRNAs or ribosomal RNAs. And if you affect, if you disrupt these sequences, then you, you, could, you could affect translation at, at many levels, including initiation. Ribosomal shunting, pausing, frame shifting, and, and so on. And, and so the, here's a here's a paper that that makes this point I think very well in bacteria. Um, so so in this study it was a genome-wide analysis of pausing, translational pausing in bacteria. They used a ribosome profiling technique, so they they could they could monitor where the ribosomes were were sitting on the message, deep sequencing of the ribosome protected fragments. And what they found was the rare, you know, codons decoded by rare tRNAs did not slow translation. So there was no pausing under those conditions in, in rich growth conditions. But where they did find pausing were in coding regions that had sequences that looked like the shine dalgarno sequence. And the shine dalgarno sequence in, in bacteria is used to initiate translation. It base pairs to the ribosomal RNA in the small ribosomal subunit. and, and gives you this, this interaction. And what they found were shine organo like sequences in the coding region. And, and this, I think in this study, they showed that that particular interaction could account for 
about 70% of the major pause sites in, in, in the messages. And this, this was done using some, some elegant uh, um, techniques using orthogonal ribosomes. The third assumption that replacing rare codons increases protein production. So there, there are a lot of studies that are published that show that codon optimization of message X, Y, or Z has higher expression. But the, these are all individual examples, and in most cases, uh, they've not been analyzed systematically, and they, they haven't looked at other variables that could affect expression. And, and they, don't, they don't indicate if, if They've tested multiple codon optimized messages, and this is the one that, or if they all work, or so, and without that additional evidence, without doing it in a more systematic way, you 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 can't tell if if the results are due to codon altering the codon bias or to other variables. And um, there's a study here from Plotkin's group, coding sequence determinants of gene expression in E. coli. Uh, which which kind of highlights uh, some of the variables, and, and, and it, it, I think it's a very nice study. So in this study, what they did is they generated a library of 154 green fluorescent protein genes, right? So all of the genes made the same protein, but they varied in their codon use, right? And so they, they changed synonymous codons at 226 out of 240 positions, and constructs differed by up to 180 nucleotides. So when they expressed these constructs, what they found is that fluorescence level varied by 254 across the library. And what was, what was very interesting about this was that uh, codon bias didn't seem to correlate with, with the fluorescence. So the codon bias and the expression didn't seem to be related, N nor did the number of rare codons the number of pairs of consecutive rare codons, the number of optimal codons. What, what accounted for most of, of their data was the predicted structure at, in, the, in the first one-third of the meshes, so the, the folding energy. That correlated very strongly with fluorescence. Uh, I think it accounted for more than 10 times as, as much of the data as any of the other variables, so that when you had more structure around the initiation codon, you had less expression and less fluorescence. So is this is this result in, in bacteria even relevant to eukaryotic cells? I think it is, um, because the similar trends of reduced stability around initiation codons re reported in a number of studies, our own work as well as many published studies, and this appears to be a kind of a universal uh, phenomenon. So the accessibility appears to be a, one of the most, if not the most important, um, factor that d determines whether or not a potential initiation codon is used to, to initiate translation. And uh, another, I think, import, very important fact is that you don't see as much codon bias in, high, in higher eukaryotes as you do in the, in the highly expressed genes of bacteria and yeast, right? So the lowest, lowest codon bias is reportedly in, in mammals. So. So even even though the codon usage, so similar studies like the one I showed in the last slide haven't been performed yet in, in mammalian cells, there, there's I think there's little reason to expect that optimizing the codon it will ex, will enhance expression, since codon bias is is, is a much smaller phenomenon in in mammalian cells, and the accessibility is appears to be just as as uh, strong a a trait, and so so it appears at least in in the microbes that the highly expressed genes evolve an optimal codon bias, but that the that codon bias by itself isn't sufficient to give you high expression. That you do require other features, for example, that affect initiation or mRNA stability. So at the end of uh, 2011, uh, this this paper came out breaking the silence. In Nature Medicine, and th this this paper discussed codon optimization and some of, some of the potential problems, which which I'll briefly uh, re review. But it it, uh, it indicated that the the whole approach of codon optimization is now on 
the, the FDA's radar screen, and it, it's it's a uh, it's of some concern. So that there are because these these proteins are used as drugs, there are some important concerns. Um, and as I as I said, this is this is pretty much standard practice right now, uh, quote on optimization. And when you do this, you're changing up to about 80 percent of the nucleotides in the coding sequence. And you know what can happen? So you you can you can end up with a misfolded protein. So you may be increasing production of the protein, but that drug might be less efficient. Um, you might it's not isolated, but you might present new epitopes on a on a protein, so this can cause problems with immunogenicity. Immunogenicity is, is a big problem with a lot of protein drugs. And, um, and in fact, even the development of inhibitory anti-drug antibodies, which reduce the effectiveness of the, of the drugs, uh, is, a, is a big problem. Um, so the, the point of, the point of, of this uh, talk was I, I wanted to discuss some some new concerns, and particularly for applications that occur in vivo, right? So, like a gene therapy, like an mRNA therapy, like a DNA or RNA vaccine. And one of, one of the problems has to do with the production of novel peptides. And so, it's, it's generally assumed that when, when you're making a construct, you're going to express the protein of interest, and, and you're going to initiate at the start codon, but this isn't true. I mean, there's a, there's a, a huge body of evidence which indicates that this is not true. And in fact, when people look, translation usually starts from multiple different sites within a messenger RNA, both in frame and out of frame, and both from AUG codons as well as non-canonical start sites, right? And in, in some cases, these alternative open reading frames actually make more protein than the main cistron. And, and what we found is that uh, d depending on, on the manipulation, you, you, can, you can modulate how much initiation is occurring from one codon or another. And a lot of this has to do with accessibility. So an, an important example of this comes from the major histic compatibility complex. And so in vertebrates, the, the major histic compatibility complex binds to peptides and these come from endogenous proteins that presented on the cell surface. It allows the immune system to, to differentiate itself from, from foreign um, proteins. Now, when people have looked, what they find is that the peptides, these major histocompatibility peptides, a lot of them are encoded in alternative reading frames. And some of these alternative reading frames initiate at non-AUG codons, suggesting that you are initiating not only at the authentic start site, but at other start sites in other reading frames from various start sites. And, and there's strong evidence for this alternative initiation from ribosome profiling studies, right? Um, so with the ribosome profiling, I'm, I've mentioned the one study before, you can map where the ribosomes are to single nucleotide resolution. And if you use a drug to block translation initiation, you can identify the initiation complexes. And and when this is done in yeast and in mammalian cells, what you find is that initiation complexes form at many different sites within mRNAs. And there have been proteomic studies which have provided data to show that these initiation events are really occurring. So you're not, you're not just getting complexes formed on messages, but you actually are expressing those proteins or peptides. And so there have been numerous uh, mechanisms proposed how this could occur, right? But at the present time, we still don't really know how ribosomes go from the site of recruitment on a message to the initiation codon. And kind of the, the, the old model that's generally accepted is scanning. And in that model, you get to these other sites by processes called leaky scanning or reinitiation. Um, our lab We've, we've come up with a, some different models of initiation that involve tethering or clustering of the translation machinery. And these, these models can actually account for many more of the observations in the literature. And, uh, and I'll, I'll describe a little bit uh, how I think, how we think that this is occurring. So in the tethering, 
uh, ribosomal complex is attached to the message at a recruitment site, in this case the M7G cap structure, and recognition of initiation codon is a direct binding reaction. So the initiator tRNA base pairs to an AUG codon, which one will depend on the distance from the recruitment site and the relative accessibility. And, and the clustering is, is a similar idea, except the interactions between the message and the, the translation machinery are, are not as tight. And so the, the effect is, is a kind of an on-off interactions that increase local, in both cases, it's all about increased local concentration and accessibility of of AUGs that, that you can base pair to. And so if, if you imagine translation from a natural message that has not been codon optimized, what, what, you, what you'll get is initiation at multiple different sites. Now, this, the, the mechanism doesn't matter. The, what's being produced is the same. That's empirical. How we get there. Um, doesn't really matter, but it, it's it's uh, it's drawn according to the tethering mechanism, and so you can imagine you're, if you start at the AUG, which is the first start site in this message, and the long blue um, squiggle is is the full length protein. Th there's also the possibility that you can initiate at other start sites, including other AUGs or non canonical start sites like CUG or ACG or GUG. And when you're in frame, you're going to make a protein that resembles the, the full length, but is truncated. And if you're out of frame, you're going to make something completely different, depending on which reading frame you're in. If you have a codon optimized message, the first thing is you will have disrupted most, if not all, of those alternative start sites. And so you'll still make the full length protein. You'll, you, you'll still make truncated proteins that have an uh, for example, an AUG codon or a GUG codon in the same reading frame that, that hasn't changed. But all of the other frame peptides will be different, right? So, or, or most of them will be different. You will have disrupted most of the natural out of frame peptides and generated a new set. Now this, is, this is a worry because um, for in vivo applications, for a gene therapy, an RNA therapy, a DNA vaccine, an RNA vaccine, these cryptic products are being made inside the patient, right? And unlike a protein drug that's made in a bioreactor and purified, and these proteins, these, these cryptic products are purified away, they're not in, inside your body. And, and these are novel, right? And so the immune system is likely to recognize them as foreign, but they, they may not be neutral. They, they, may, they, you know, they may be hormones. They may be toxins. You, you just don't know. Some of these may have never been expressed before. And, and, and so I think this is an enormous concern. Um, another, another potential problem with codon optimizing wholesale codon changes is that you're altering mRNA editing within messages. And so RNA editing, these are post-transcriptional modifications that would change specific nucleotides. And so I talked earlier about A2Y editing in the tRNA. But this, this also occurs in mRNAs, and it's, it's, the, it's the predominant uh, editing, type of editing in higher eukaryotes. And the substrate for it is, is simply imperfect double-stranded regions of RNA, so that it, it's, it's, it's likely that these can be generated. Um, the problem with A2Y editing is that it changes, you, you, you change you can change the amino acid that's being encoded, and so this can have functional consequences. And there, there are examples from real proteins that are all, that have A to Y editing that are functionally modified upon editing, right? And there's, there's a couple of examples here: Nova One and uh, insulin-like growth factor binding protein Seven that, that show these sorts of, of effects. And, and so, so if you if you if you've altered the the post transcriptional modifications of the message, so you, you've gotten rid of what was normally there. You may have introduced new editing sites, and you, so you may have changed the the coding potential of the of the message or the splicing. And like the cryptic products, you, you don't 
you don't really know what the functional effects might be or the toxicity of, of these of these altered proteins. These are these are novel. These will be novel proteins, and the the effects. Well, in the immune response, I, I think, would be an obvious one, but there, there may be others as well. And, and so, to summarize, um, so the, the codon usage of, of many of many genes has has evolved under different selective pressures. Right? It's not just it's not just the coding sequence, not just the amino acid sequence, but there are other factors, other variables that are selected for. And codon optimization preserves the amino acid sequence, the coding potential. But it, but it, it uh, in, in, in doing so, you lose a lot of the other information for at the primary level, for example, that is encoded. And in fact, the, the whole premise for codon optimization appear, appears to be flawed. And for in vivo applications, so for, for applications where constructs are going into people and the proteins are being expressed in the patient, then th there are other real concerns, I think. So there's all of the concerns of altered protein conformation still apply, but in addition, you're making novel peptides that you know, throw on the dice, you just don't know. And the same with the post-transcriptional modifications. And and so, the, at, at, the, at this point, I think the use of codon optimization, the increased expression for these in vivo applications, may be pretty dangerous and and should should be thought about very very carefully. And I, I would just like to acknowledge some of my funding sources and uh, take a look to see if there's any questions. One question here is: uh, Is there any information on the effect of the mRNA sequ sequence of different codon utilization, same protein, on the mRNA exit from the nucleus to the cytoplasm? One could imagine that the mRNA sequence with strong 3D structure around the five prime might have difficulty leaving the nucleus and therefore give less translated protein. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any any studies. That have that have um, that have shown have shown this or have tested this. Um, it might might be it might be a reasonable uh, possibility. I, but uh, yeah, I just, I just I don't know if that's if anybody's actually looked at that in any kind of a systematic way. Here's another question. It says, in order to preserve protein folding when expressing it in a heterologous system, it seems a good strategy to preserve the relative ranking at each position. Now, if, if you're referring to the relative ranking of the codons, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I, I believe that the codon usage tables really give you any kind of a real indication of what's abundant or real for, for a number of reasons. I'm not even sure that's something that can be empirically determined, to be honest. And when people have um, looked at, you know, st stretches of rare codons, 
in, in most cases, they don't get the effect of slowing which, which they expect. Um, I've, I've seen some examples, one example I can remember where they did, and, and, and there are other studies where, in fact, stretches of rare codons can actually enhance elongation, and where, where people have uh, suggested that it might be something called tRNA channeling, where the reuse of the same codon, even if it's a rare codon, enhances translation. So it, it's, it's I, th I think it's, it's more more complex than, than just trying to maintain a ranking, especially when the, when the basis for the ranking is is suspect. That's it. So, um, so here's, a, here's another question. Uh, sickle cell anemia, an inherited genetic disorder, has origin in selective pressure of malaria. Do you think gene therapy is better or just marriage counseling to avoid birth of homozygous sickle cell patients in the context of codon usage and lots of risk in gene therapy? Well, I, I think... I think this is out of my element to to comment on on this. On this. I'm, I'm a basic scientist, and so I can tell you what what the risks are. I'm not sure if I could counsel uh, for gene therapy. Although I think I, I think the risks in gene therapy could be minimized to a huge extent if, if you if, uh, if if you if you avoid the the use of codon optimization, but. Uh, the, the and, and in fact, one of, one of the reasons um, I think this this should be discussed is that I, I think things like gene therapy and the vaccines I think they have tremendous potential, but if if it's done in the wrong way, I think it may lead to a lot of problems and in some cases death, which which would would be Kind of a, it would be a terrible kind of consequence of, a, of what I think is a potentially very, very promising approaches, and 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 so I don't I don't think there are the, the, the risks are inherent inherently as big as you might expect with some of these approaches, but the the, the manipulations that are done may make it worse. Um, so there's a question: Are the amino acid transferases also expressed differentially? And um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I would I would imagine so. I would imagine so. While we. Uh, Before we wait to see if any other uh, questions are coming in, uh, let me put up this last slide. So if, if you're, if you're um, looking for educational credits, you can, you can follow the link and, uh, and uh, get some of your continuing education credits. And I don't see any more questions, so I would uh I would say that we're we're done here. <laughs>